for all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Rob Willie. He is the operating partner at Emil Capital and CMO for Chair Bundy. On the conversation today, we talk a lot about startup marketing or high growth marketing, I should clarify, and learn uh, quite a bit about Chair Bundy, what tart cherry juice is, which is where Cherry Bundy gets its name, what the role of CMO is at a high growth company like Chair Bundy how culture plays a role in your marketing efforts and what marketers should be learning about right now and much more. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Rob Willie. Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So besides the Tar Heel, <laughs> which which uh, we were just talking about, we like to get to know people initially on this show and, and learn something interesting about you. And I hear that you are an expert on how clothes fit. And I would love for you to tell me a little bit more about that, because now I feel a little self-conscious when we, next time we see each other. Yeah, well, I mean, there's probably a bunch of high school kids that would probably argue that fact. But I, my first job in high school was I worked at Mr. Formal, which is like a small tuxedo rental store in Portland, Oregon, where the majority of our businesses was either weddings, right, or prom season at local high schools. And so it is there that I spent years of my life sizing high school kids for rental tuxedos and learning to teach them how to put on a vest or a cummerbund or other things that actually I've now taken into my real life. And now I actually really like looking at the way like clothes are tailored and other things fit from a design perspective. So I'd like to say that it kind of informed my career later in life. <laughs> Love that. Love that. I have gotten turned on to like these online places, like for suits, online made to made to measure or made to order suits. And I don't think I can ever go back now. We've never met in person, but I'm quite square. Like, like shoulders are broad, but I'm short and it's everything has to be tailored. But like, if you start from like made to order, I've uh, found the best luck. And when things fit, man, they feel like your confidence level goes up. I think, I don't know. I don't know if you have this thing. The Deion Sanders, you know, his whole thing, like look great, play great. That whole mantra I think is totally true. Like if you feel confident in your person, and I think a lot of us derive that from what we wear, I think it just brings a whole new sort of like swag to everyday life. I definitely believe in that. I'm, I'm more of a uniform person, to be real. Like I wear the same thing every day and COVID has only exacerbated that. But I, you know, I wear a black t-shirt. I wear some sort of like black pants. I've eased off the sweatpants sort of like movement that we all had during COVID. So now I wear regular pants occasionally, but they all got to fit. They all got to fit. And I agree with you, especially, I know I have a bunch of friends who are on the shorter side. They especially struggle with like everything they have has to be tailored, be taken up, be taken in. So it's a really interesting life skill that I developed in my, one of my first jobs out of high school that truly I definitely has informed, if nothing else, the way that I shop. So it's an interesting story, and I still have fond memories of tuxedo fittings. <laughs> well, it's, it's an interesting job to to start start off with for sure. Now, kind of like the big left turn or right turn here. What's been your path? You're now, if I get this right, you're the operating partner at Emil Capital. And you're also the CMO at Cherubundi, which we'll spend a good bit of time talking about. But like, what was your path from? high school days, fitting high school students, et cetera, to now the business world, this private equity side of the equation, and then operating as a CMO. Yeah, from Mr. Formal to now, right? It's been a long ride. I mean, you and I both are Tar Heels, so we both went to University of North Carolina. Like, I kind of went through the traditional sort of trajectory of, like, going to college, kicking around in, like, journalism or business and kind of seeing the world. And uh, very clearly, you know, one of the most probably... One big inflection point in my life, let alone my career, was moving to New York City out of college. And that's where I was introduced to advertising. That's when advertising was sort of like, you know, a really cool place to work. It was working at a startup before startups really existed. And this is in the early 2000s. And so my journey from there was working with big brands 
on the agency side and honestly seeing how like slow and bureaucratic and uninspiring creatively the work was. And we all see their campaigns. We all see TV spots still to this day, right? The, the face of advertising clearly has changed dramatically since those days. But even then, it was very vanilla. It was very plain, very safe for big companies to say or do anything worth talking about. And I thought, how boring, like what a waste of time. And so for me, that really started to say like, I don't fit here. And that was a really interesting learning. Like you learn by doing things wrong sometimes. And I definitively figured out that I didn't belong, one, on the agency side for very long, and two, working with or for big companies. And those, that was really inspirational for me. You know, it was frustrating because we all want to fit in. We all want to find our thing, right? And while this was all going on, clearly, you know, the internet was exploding. The iPhone wasn't far from being invented. Like life was changing in terms of how companies, particularly how young companies like startups uh, were going to market. And so I said, there's something clearly I need to learn. And I need to learn because I want to go to work at these startups. I want to work on the company side. I want to build a brand. I want to operate a company. And so I went to business school. And business school is not for everybody. Don't get me wrong. It's expensive. Sometimes it doesn't really help your career. For me, it gave me a sense of like, financial acumen that I did not have as a marketer, particularly on the agency side. There was just no exposure to P&Ls, to innovation roadmaps, to financial conversations, to operations and supply chain. And so I went to Columbia, spent time at Columbia in business school, and then came out of Columbia, long story short, and went directly to work for startups. And I was living in San Francisco. And really one of the more important jobs is I went to work for the soap company method. And that was kind of like the foundation of where I learned what culture, purpose, uh, young brands who do interesting things, like they were kind of one of the OGs in really disrupting a large category like packaged goods. So that set put me on a path to where working with young brands, I then went on to be uh, the VP of marketing at TaskRabbit. I was the CMO of the late stage fashion e-commerce brand Spring. So that kind of built this resume for me as someone who had slowly but surely ascended to the C-suite in a way that uh, someone like Emil Capital, who was building an operating team, could really bring a lot of advice, guidance, structure, and eventual sort of operational IQ to their portfolio of companies. And so I kind of fit that profile. It was all through, though, operational learning. You know, I put in the work and I was willing to take risks. I was willing to move. I moved east to west to back to east. So like I chased it. And that's how I got to where I am today. By no means do I think I'm anywhere where near the end, but that was my route, which is, you know, I climbed through a bunch of startups and learned by doing. Well, I mean, it's worked, right? <laughs> like you've had some phenomenal experience at, at the places you just mentioned, Method, Task Rabbit, Spring, now at Cherubundi, as which is an operating company or portfolio company of Emil Capital. Which came first? Was it the Emil Capital or Chair Bundy, or did it come at the same time? It was Emil Capital. So Emil Capital um, asked me to work on a number of companies. Chair Bundy wasn't the first one. There were a couple other that I worked on and touched, kind of honestly showcased a little bit of my style. So not, uh, they, the Emil really tries to partner us operate as an operating team with the right portfolio companies in style or experience, or obviously, you know, what your operational specialty is, mine's marketing. So they cast us into these companies based on those criteria. So I got to know them, they got to know me. And what became very clear was from a standpoint of Cherubundi is that I fit the profile of what Cherubundi was trying to do for a lot of reasons. Most of which I think outside of marketing was I'm really a big part of their addressable audience. And we'll talk about Cherubundi in a minute, but that was one thing that intuitively I brought to the table that you can't buy or you can't necessarily higher for. And so it was, an, it was an easy, fast fit that now was nearly three years ago. Well, let's talk about Chair Bundy. What is it? How do you describe what the company does? Well, let me ask you a question. Before speaking to me, had you heard about Tart Cherries? I have not. I had not. No. And another question. Do you shop in the juice aisle in the grocery store? Occasionally. So my guess is growing up, you had a number of juices. Did you have orange juice when you were a kid? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Apple I bet juice. Some apple juice, but mainly orange. And it was that concentrated frozen stuff that you had to mix back. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, yeah. You, <laughs> your parents put in the freezer, it was like in a yeah, can. <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. <laughs> I'm willing to bet that wasn't juice, just so you know. That was something. <laughs> Tasted like juice, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah it looked like juice. Right. <laughs> oh, my God, yeah, I forgot about that. So, yeah, that's – nonetheless, I don't really think to a large degree juice has come that far for then. Like, it's still from concentrate. It still has a bunch of science in it. I think most of us, our generation and younger, question if it's really juice at all. And we have become much more savvy with labels. Like nutrition is a thing. And we all took nutrition classes, most of us in college. Definitely, you know, health and wellness has become this massive sort of movement. So we're all a lot smarter than our parents were. And candidly, I wouldn't give my eight-year-old son orange juice. He doesn't drink orange juice. Now, he does drink a bunch of sports drinks, and those are still debatable in my mind. And you can't keep Capri Sun out of his life, no matter how hard you try. But... I'm getting far away from the question that you asked, but nonetheless, we are surrounded by all these drinks, all these beverages, right? Like they're definitely part of our life. And most of them are owned by really big companies. Like every other product in the grocery store, it's usually owned by like a handful of companies out there that have products in every aisle. And for most of us, especially me, and I, I'm sure you, like we probably know too much. We see a little bit of the Wizard of Oz and to me, that was an interesting learning that I came very quickly to when I joined Chair Bundy. So Chair Bundy is uh, a mid-stage, high-growth uh, tart cherry company that makes sports nutrition products, all born from tart cherries. And so I, like you, when I got to Chair Bundy, had never heard of tart cherries. And our primary audience is what we call the health lead which is the male and female everyday app. We, among many of them, the weekend warriors, those that play recreational sports, that work out at the gym a couple days a week, all of us suffer from anti-inflammation and some of us from lack of sleep or lack of quality. And tart cherries are both a natural solution or nature's secret weapon to both of those things. That was all things I had to learn very early on. Tart cherries in general, born from... Tart cherries on U.S. farms in places like Utah and Michigan are where we source our products from. And there's a lot of antioxidants in those products to date that are naturally derived with no science involved. And so we say, wow, that's a really interesting origin in terms of these products. And by no means am I the founder of Chair Bundy. So Chair Bundy was founded about 20 years ago. It literally is a 20-year overnight success. And it's a company that's been a long time coming. And all of the trends around health and wellness and food as medicine and just in general sports nutrition have kind of come to the perfect storm that has made Cherubundi a company that really is in a high growth trajectory that is growing. It's a nationwide, nationally distributed product. And all of that came from this idea of, yes, tart cherries have natural powers, but also our really our, our entire proving ground was we started selling into collegiate professional teams almost a decade ago. And those teams all have registered dietitians on their rosters that help make help their athletes eat, sleep, drink better to ultimately enhance performance. And so we say from U.S. farms to sports field, our product is building a sports monopoly in recovery. That is our goal. That is who we want to be is we want to own sports recovery. In order to do that, we obviously have to have lots and lots of teams. So 10 years later, we now sell into, meaning they purchase every month from us, over 400 collegiate and professional sports teams across all different sports. So we obviously have baseball, football, basketball. We have every NFL team, every Power 5 conference team in college. We have nearly every MLS team. The roster is basically, if you see a team play on Saturday and Sunday on TV, I promise you we send them, they actually buy product and we ship it to their, their stadium. So with that learning, I then was convinced and I joined the team, the company to help people like you hear about it. And that's really where we started. And frankly, that's where we're at is 400 plus teams, national distribution in over 20,000 stores. We have a massive business online. We have a D2C channel. So the business is, I think, realizing itself, you know, like any fun high growth startup is like adolescence. You know, it can be painful 
it can be confusing. You kind of get lost, you make some bad decisions, but ultimately you come out the other side, hopefully a really good human. And I think that's about where we are. Well, I mean, the market that you're in is ginormous. I mean, sports recovery, uh, sports nutrition in general, if you kind of expand from there. And it's just kind of boggles my mind that I hadn't heard of tart cherries before. And <laughs> maybe I'm not doing a good job, but like I do go to the gym. I am a CrossFit person. So I go to the box, so to speak, hopefully three. Usually I try to achieve four times a week, not always successful, but I've got aches and pains everywhere. Like, what is it? Do you know? I mean, a lot of drugs on the market today, and I don't mean to make tart cherries a drug, but like the way they work is a, still a mystery to us, regardless of whether they were you know, approved by the FDA, et cetera. But like, do you know what it is about the tart cherries themselves? Like why they're successful at helping? Well, let me first caveat this, that I am no doctor. You know me well enough that you would not trust me with your life, I presume. Well, I knew that as soon as we started with advertising agencies. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? I was dead on arrival. There's no way you were going to let me give you health advice. So the short answer is no. I don't know exactly how they work. Right? I don't know how your body or my body or anyone actually digests and takes in antioxidants. And the actual measuring factor of an antioxidant, at least in the tart chair world, is called anthocyanin. And we test for anthocyanins. That is basically how we determine, quote unquote, the maximum strength of a tart cherry. Now, the company, in addition to that, because there are various tart cherry companies out there, most of them look like your grandma's apple juice, to be real. So if you look at us, tell me that you don't want to live in the juice aisle without telling me you don't want to live in the juice aisle. We pretty much live up to that billing because we don't look like the rest of them, right? And that is intentional. Now, we also were derived from an extraction process at Cornell University that is really the reason why we exist, which is our founder at that time discovered with Cornell University scientists how to extract more anthocyanin out of a tart cherry through a proprietary process that makes our tart cherries stronger, basically the most effective tart cherry juice in the market. And that is the basis by which the sports teams order from us is we just make the best tart cherry juice. And the best meaning the strongest, the highest anth anthocyanins, the most antioxidants, and thus the best, fastest recovery via sleep and fighting anti-inflammation. And so that is the high level sort of summary of why our business frankly deserves to exist. I love it. And thanks for going down the science path with me because it's always interesting to try to figure out. And to your point, like you are derived from a fruit but I would struggle to call you a juice in my book, if that makes sense. I agree with you. Like, you know, that's why, although we are in the juice aisle in grocery stores, we don't live in the juice section of call it any online store. You know, we don't refer to our business as a juice business. We refer to our business as the recovery business. Yes, we fight. We have some very scientifically proven benefits. It's not hard to find a bunch of science online, by the way, that validates every claim I've just made. So this isn't hocus pocus. This isn't like trying to say you drink orange juice because of the vitamin C when you know full well that you probably could get vitamin C in a bunch of better ways. Like this is a proven scientific product that has obviously lots of credentials, but in addition to that, has lots of different formats. So we're in, we have a concentrate product. We, of course, have an eight ounce product. We have a 32 ounce product. We are trying in various ways to meet health leads wherever they want to recover. And oftentimes that's post gym, like yourself walking home in a cab, depending on what city you live in, driving, commuting to work. There's a lot of different sort of, we call them occasions that people want to recover in or from that a typical juice business wouldn't consider or think about or even make products for. So I agree with you. We look and sound a lot different. And I spent three years defining that, frankly, like that is very much part of my remit. And what I've done is if you would have found us three years ago, we sounded a little bit like a juice company. We had a, a big team business and we were in grocery stores, but we didn't highlight all of the benefits or most importantly, the recovery benefits and talk about our business the way we do today. And so that was kind of the start of the start. That was the next chapter of this company. That's where we've seen a lot of success in the past few years. And that's why I'm talking to people like yourself is, you know, I need more Allens to hear about tart cherries. That's ultimately my goal. And you're 
the perfect profile, frankly, that is working out every once in a while, a couple times a week, committed to it. Yes, you're also doing something pretty high. High intensity workouts create a lot of inflammation. So we are a perfect product for you and your behaviors to help you recover so you can work out better. Oh, yeah. I mean, and and folks like myself, uh, we've tried a lot of different things, right? Like my chiropractor loves to see me. (laughs) Uh, Aches and pains and nerve issues from time to time. But then supplements, vitamins, pre-workouts, post-workouts. I think we probably all have a whole cabinet somewhere full of stuff that we've tried or, or, or looking to, you know, improve you know, ourself and, and how we feel basically. So yeah, it totally makes sense to me. And the, and the, the market for sports nutrition is ginormous. I mean, there's whole stores that are just that, right? Like just as one example, thinking about the number of SKUs and different product formats, et cetera. So I think recovery is something that I haven't seen as much with, right? Like in not to call out brands, but you see some protein type recovery solutions. You see obviously caffeine, which always kind of makes me scratch my head. Like, yes, I could use a pick me up, but like, is that really helping me recover? I'm not sure. So I'm going to have to try this tart cherry juice thing. So <laughs> yeah, it's like, like we said, like the grocery store, you know, the category is filled it's the land of giants. And you're right. Sports nutrition is the, uh, in my world, at least as you know, as I came to understand it, kind of came in two formats. One, it came in supplements, but you're right. Vitamins and a bunch of other scientifically derived products and powders and other forms have entire stores, entire categories dedicated to them. And those are oftentimes difficult to understand, but at the same time, there are countless solutions that is a really difficult thing to decipher. The other part of the category that was really familiar to me and I, you know, as a kid, and I think all of us know is hydration. So you have this little bit like pre-workout supplement driven sort of daily routine. And then you have this during workout hydration behavior, which is, you know, whether it be water bottles, drinking fountains, or other sorts of sports drinks that everyone knows, you know, that are, they own all of the shelf space. They own the majority of the category spend. Almost, they have awareness above 90%. We've looked at their studies, we've done brand trackers and all those things. And so they are the category leaders. And those are also almost exclusively scientifically based. Part of our fight, if you want to talk and what we fight for and what we fight against. So we fight for all natural recovery, but in doing so, we fight against synthetic science. So we believe that all natural is better. And in fact, Emil Capital has an investment thesis where many of our portfolio companies are naturally derived because we think things that come from the ground are better than things that come from a lab. And so with that platform, you know, with understanding our competitive differentiation is where this company, like I said, was founded, where it continues to grow, where we will continue to innovate and make new products around. But knowing full well, yes, this is a category full of huge brands. And my job as a marketer and as CMO is to figure out how to architect a plan that we can do better, execute more frequently, faster than they can. And I promise you, it doesn't mean buy more media. Those are, you cannot outspend them. And so it unfortunately means that at least in the near term, LeBron James is not in the cards for us, right? And so those things kind of show you very quickly, oh man, that's the job of a startup CMO. So what are the, what are the things, what is the roles and responsibilities that I as a leader need to determine, align this organization to do, to execute that helps us win that race. And that is essentially if what startups have to do in order to win in any category. Where do you start? Like, I mean, I know you've been there, you've been there about three years, but like along that startup CMO philosophy of like what the job is you obviously did your research maybe you started there right learning about the product etc but like where'd you start and like how have you built like what does marketing look like as well at Cherubundi if you will yeah no problem so that you and I have talked about this before and and I have this saying that I I think some marketers find offensive or find difficult to embrace but it's really where I started which is marketing is the tax you pay for being unremarkable And a colleague told me that when I was at TaskRabbit. And at first I was like, what? You know, like, hey, yo, like be nice. And then I started to like 
actually think about it. And he was right. He was right. The tax for an unremarkable product is very, very high. To convince someone to buy, use, and rebuy a product that is no different or better than any other product on the market requires a lot of money. So that's where I started. I said, what's different? What's better about this company, about this product? What is our competitive advantage? What makes us remarkable? And so I got very quickly right to sports teams and science and you know our history and those things. I was like, this is a real thing. Now, I think anyone should start with that no matter what role they hold in an organization is why do you believe that where you work? Some people don't have to believe. They're just happy to get up and go to work. I'm not one of those people. I'm definitely not interested at, at, in working at a company that one, I don't believe in, and that two, that it isn't any fun. This has to be fun. And if not, why bother? So I looked at the organization. I looked at the team we were building, obviously it's the product that was we were, we were making every day. And I started to say, hey, this thing has potential. It's unrealized and it's going to take a lot of change, but there could be a there there. And so my job at CMO then is to say like, well, how can I make that come to fruition in my own role in marketing and where we started and what we believe, and it won't take you too long to figure that out as you look at our marketing or go to our Instagram feed or any of our social profiles is we knew obviously we could not outspend Gatorade, body armor, any sports nutrition drink. We were not going to spend, outspend them. In fact, we tried before I got there. So we have the infamous, probably at this point, claim to one of the worst named college football bowl games of all time. And it's funny. And, you know, I look back at it and say, I see the strategy. You know, another way to say it is our strategy was showing and it wasn't a good look. So the Cherubundi Tart Cherry Boca Raton Bowl, get out of here, man. That, that is not only a mouthful. It does not, it just doesn't roll off your tongue, but we did it. We did it. And the reason why we did it is we're like, we want to move into the world of sports, right? We have this growing business in sports teams. We need to start to be in sports. We did deals with a few universities. We took a very traditional approach and that not only could we not afford that, it was not sustainable. It wasn't driving the business. And so he said, when I got here, I started to like peel this back. And I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa, this is a lot of money. We had to deal with ESPN. I was like, it's, it looks like we just took Gatorade's playbook and tried to do it ourselves. I'm like, that's not going to work. And so we stopped all of that. We turned all of that off. And we said, what makes us different? Well, we have this passionate community of people who love our products. Okay, cool. That sounds interesting. And then in addition to that, what do we need to do? Well, I need to educate people. Naming a bowl game doesn't provide education. Running 30-second commercials on ESPN, pretty difficult to, to create education. So how do we essentially put a microphone on this community of people who love our products, including our sports teams, and use them for education? And what came out of that was an influencer program called the Pit Crew. It's a clever name, Cherry Pit, yes, Pit Crew, but it's now a huge essentially ambassador program that has, of course, athletes, but also registered dietitians. It has scientists, it has doctors, it has all sorts of experts on it that we use as our advocates to provide testimonial sort of content for education. And that it's a super high touch. I mean, it's like casting for a movie, a really big, long movie. But we cast these people, we go out, they come to us, we figure out if they really love our products. None of these people did not use our product before we met them. In other words, they chose us before we chose them. And that is how we put this whole crew together. And that is the way in which we've chose to differentiate ourselves to go back to like, what do we go to market differently than these big brands? What can we do better? Well, because we're a little brand, because we care, because we're super hands-on, we can cast into these programs in ways that I think big brands, one, don't want to spend their time doing, and two, can't scale to the point which they need. They can't reach, very few influencers can reach, you know, a million eyeballs in 30 seconds. And that's the power of TV. So they go that route. And I don't blame them. There's a definite portion of every media plan that, you know, at, at that level of spend, that should be spent in TV. You know, the internet economics of that spend makes sense. They don't at our size. And so that's where we began. That's where we built our content. That's how we created our marketing plan and essentially have built everything, whether it be PR, earned media, owned media, everything we do from a standpoint of events is to put, is basically amplify that in different channels all the time. Yeah, it totally makes sense. I mean, I think you said you're now up to, as one example of people that could be in that pit career, up to 400 sports teams. 
uh, or over 400 sports teams that are buying your product, they're already using it, you know, like as one example, like, but you've got, I'm sure you got everyday people in there as well, as well as the experts you mentioned, like, have you been able to form like specific athlete partnerships as well? Or how has that worked? Yeah. So I avoided that for the first two years. I just didn't think we were ready. We needed, I felt like to be, it's a word that, you know, everyone uses, but I feel like, you know, we wanted to be our true best selves. We wanted to be our authentic selves in the world, which means we needed to like continue to build this roster of teams. We needed to collect these groups of ambassadors that already loved our products. We needed honestly to reface a lot of our touch points to really help people understand what tart cherry juice was and why us. And so we had to do all of that sort of housekeeping. And then we said, okay, at the start of this past year, we and the investors operating team looked around and said, I think we're ready. I think we're ready. You know, we're not raising capital. We closed our last round over a year and a half ago, but we would love some additional athletes who already love and use our products to join us in this cause. And so we went out, we talked to every agent, it felt like we talked to countless amounts of athletes and just began to have conversations and kind of saw who raised their hand, who fit well with us. I talked to all of them. Honestly, like we built an entire sports marketing team to not only compile some athletes, but also activate them in ways that they felt interested in. And so we engaged at a different level. This was just not a commercial agreement. And so the two sort of leaders of this program are Debo Samuels, who's the all pro wide receiver for the 49ers. And then Lindsay Horan, who is the U.S. women's national team captain. Those two people are who we first brought on. Now, we have since added to that group as a longer list of different of different athletes but all of those athletes those tier 1 athletes have come on as both of course pit crew members but also investors and so that showcases to us and i think to the world the power of our products that these elite athletes also are willing to stand up and say no i'm going to stand with this company i'm going to invest and help them grow because of the power of tart cherry juice and by and large both of those athletes have been great partners. You know, we're currently running a whole content program with Debo. We, Lindsay has been such a good spokesperson for us, both doing community events, but also, you know, in her social feeds. The U.S. Women's National Team is a big customer of ours. So it's not hard to find our juice in their feed, which is kind of fun. So anyway, like all of those things have been kind of bubbling up to the top. So yes, everyone from big time professional athletes, all the way down to the use and the me's of the world, the everyday athletes who everyone is looking to, you know, recover better. Just to pull out a couple of things you said, like one waiting to be ready for that. I think that's brilliant, but probably really hard to do. <laughs> if you're other marketers that are listening to us talk about this, but I think to your point, like to get your story right, to get what it means to be chair Bundy, right first before you then apply another person's influence and frankly personal brand to to this effort i think it makes a lot of sense make sure who you are first before you venture into that yeah it's like uh you gotta grow up and figure out who you are before you get married right like i think there's a lot of human characteristics that i provide in storytelling to this brand like i i, I try to treat this brand like to talk like a human to speak like a person right and not to market people. People can see through marketing. You know, I, I, nobody likes pre-roll banner ads. Nobody likes their content to be disrupted with advertising. And that was one of the things I saw when I was in advertising. I was like, this feels like an ad. Who wants to watch this? Nobody wants to watch this, right? We, this is how like TiVo back in the day. And now, of course, like everyone has it. Like we all speed through the ads. So I have never aspired particularly at this company, to make advertising. And what that has forced us to do is the hard stuff. And I, I would say that you're right. Like, it was not only a testament of patience, but we did all the hard things. And I think marketers in general, I think people maybe in general, we avoid doing the hard thing. And the hard thing takes discipline. It takes consistency. And I don't care if you're like getting on a Peloton bike every day, going to the gym every day, or trying to build a brand every day. They're hard and they require decisions and trade-offs. And 
in doing so, we got everything in order to be ready for the minute that you met us. And so we've been preparing for that first date for like two years. You know what I mean? Like being our best selves. And so we cleaned up a lot. Like we fixed all of our Amazon pages. We updated our entire website. We made it easy to buy our products. We launched some new innovation. We stopped some old innovation. We repackaged our products. And it wasn't a marketing initiative, to be clear. It was an organizational initiative, one that in which the entire company across every department bought into. And that was a huge lift for us to get to the next level. And then, yes, we were ready. But I, I think we all want to rush to the end, right? Like, we all just want the fun parts, which is like, let's sign athletes, let's raise money, you know, let's buy TV ads, let's do a bunch of expensive marketing. And like I said, I, I never aspired to do the marketing part. I just wanted to do the content part. And to make the content interesting, we had to fix all the rest of it first. I love it. I love it. Well, one other thing, I, and I think it's a smaller item, but I want to pull it out is, as you were working, you decided to work with kind of more, more brand name athletes, quote unquote, influencers, and like helping to create a pathway for them to be investors, I think was also kind of an interesting piece I wanted to pull out because kind of Ryan Reynolds them, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and for those, if you're living under a rock listening to this, you don't know who Ryan Reynolds is, you know, he, I guess is an owner of Aviation Gen, Mint Mobile, now Wrexham soccer team in, uh, in the UK or in Wales, I should say more specifically within the UK. And there's a, an element, I think, of like commitment that that demonstrates on behalf of the people that are aligned to your product. So I like that. I like the aspect as well. Yeah, it's a, it definitely, you know, starts touching on things like values. And yeah, I mean, I can only aspire to be like Ryan Reynolds at some point in my life, to be honest, like every aspect of his life seems pretty amazing. But also the show, Wex, great show. If you're not watching it, shout out. Yeah, I just watched the first episode last night, so I'm getting started in it myself. But yeah, I like it so far. It's good. It's surprisingly good. I, I'll be honest with you. I was, I was skeptical coming in. I was like, oh, come on. How much of this is going to be advertising? And the story behind it is, is so far so good. Like, you know, I'm, I'm following along. And so that's good content. And I will happily have that serve me ads, whether it's because like, by the way, his brands are all over that thing, right? Like aviation gins in it. They're on the jerseys, right? You can tell like he's wove his companies into this story, but it's a story. And I'm like, that is really brilliant marketing. I feel like by the end, I'm really going to know this town too, like the way that they, they, they keep, and I'm like, I, I have to go there now, right? Like, like I have to figure out what, like, I want to go see the town. So the town is going to benefit too, which I think is a big story as well. So. Yeah. I mean, the town is like, you know, they say in Sex in the City that New York was the fifth character. Like, I think that's the same in, in his, in this show, right? The town is such a big part of the story of the history of the team. So Yeah. Anyway, yes, I think it is, there's a certain amount of more commitment, more partnership that comes from these investment deals that isn't always the case in, say, a spokesperson or commercially oriented agreement in other brands and other companies. And uh, that is, like I said, that, that was criteria number one, is you had already had to be drinking us before I called you. If I had to explain us, our products, or tart cherry juice to you, first time one of us on the team spoke to you, this was not a good fit. And that made the criteria actually pretty easy to evaluate, which was nice. It was simple. And then it just became about like, do you want to work together? What are the business terms? How do we do this in a way that, you know, really doesn't me, isn't me forcing you to do things. It's just you doing you and us coming along for the ride. And that was the spirit of the agreement that both Debo and Lindsay really brought a lot to the table. What I want to ask you, it came up in a prior conversation with you, and I, I want to hit on it here because we're talking about athletes, we're talking about community building. What element does culture play in marketing as you think about it? It should be if we're doing our jobs right where you start, not where you end. You know, I was speaking of culture, I saw I was on TikTok and it was a really interesting comparison. It said there's a huge difference between trying to pay attention versus trying to get attention. And so many commercial brands are trying to get attention. They're just trying to win the moment. And they're trying to do a bunch of stunt marketing on a daily basis that, you know, hijacks your social feed, call it. And those moments are fleeting. We all know how that feels as people. 
trying to get someone's attention feels thirsty. You know, it feels not great. And yet the brands that best live in culture are simply the brands that pay attention. They're interesting. They have a point of view. They're current with the times. They understand who they are. And another way to talk about it is no successful first date has one person just talking about themselves the whole time. That's a bad strategy, right? So good first dates pay attention. They listen. They share stories. You know, they have discussions. And that is what we as a brand have chosen to do. And the way we've chosen to do that is by paying attention to culture. And all we want to do is listen and learn and participate in culture where we belong as a sports nutrition brand. We belong in the world of sporting. We belong in conversations around health and wellness and food as medicine. And in those worlds, we want to be interesting. We want to be optimistic. We want to be real. And that is the importance to answer your question around culture, in my opinion. Find where you fit and then pay attention. And in doing so, you'll attract a lot of other people who are just as interesting as you are. And that's where we call our crew, right? That's the people we want to belong with. And it all begins with culture, frankly. And so that is that is the moment where we said, okay, we're going to stop buying ads and we're going to start paying attention. And that's when our business started to be really interesting. That's when athletes said, hey, I want to work with you. Hey, let's make content together. That's where consumers honestly started to get really loyal. So retention and the unit economics of our busy, busy business got a lot better because our email campaigns became interesting. They wanted to read our email. And then, of course, our social feeds got better. And everything else, we started living in your feed, like your friends and your family and other brands that you love. And so anyway, it was all born from that. And I couldn't emphasize culture as a starting point for marketing more than probably any other thing. Yeah, I agree. And I think it helps to make you relevant to those cultures that you're trying to influence or participate in. And to your point about like, uh, you know, those are the, those are the people that your crew, the people you want to hang around with your pit crew has an, as a further example of that. You know, there's subcultures to these health leets, I think, as you call them, right? Like I'll use the CrossFit as another example. Like there's nothing more true about a CrossFit athlete than they like to talk about CrossFit. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to make the show. How do you know someone's in CrossFit? They talk about it. Oh, yeah. yeah. They'll, they'll tell you. Ad nauseum will tell you. Like I do. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, it, it's just, it becomes a part of who you are. Like it defines you. And it's shared, frankly, for better or for worse, it's shared torture for 45 minutes to an hour <laughs> with your with your fellow crew. So it's uh, you know shared experience as well. And I think as brands, to your point, like the good ones simply pay attention. I couldn't agree more. Like they just pay attention, they listen, they participate, they find the right moments to do that, right? And they provide remarkable products too. Like this is probably the worst example because this, I'm going to talk about it because it's a title sponsor of CrossFit, but like the fact that CrossFit Games are no longer sponsored by Reebok and now there's no name, apparently, you know, historically no name brand noble is now the like sponsor of this olympic event in my mind right quote unquote olympic event you know in my mind in, in my community it just was like the perfect example of seeding seeding a market where reebok had previously established themselves and was a brand that was providing good value to the community as well and they just walked away and this you know i think this is a, an example of like if you are in the community, like stay in the community, <laughs> continue to participate and be an active member. No, you're right. It's consistency matters. Paying attention, meaning engaging in the community matters. And that it's funny. We have come to expect that from our brands, not just, you know, our spouses or our partners or our friends. Like we've, if you're on our social feed, you, I, I consider that high bar. You better be interesting to be there. Same thing, if I allow you to email me, like if I sign up for your emails, you better respect that. And so it's funny how we've almost humanized brands at this point. And whether you're part of the CrossFit community, by the way, I am shameful about this too, because I have the same relationship with Peloton. That's another one of those communities. Like if you're in it, you talk about it. And I became one of those people during COVID. And so I totally understand that sentiment. Like it's part of my identity, my DNA almost, my daily habits. So 
anyway, those are those are the subcultures that you're talking about that I think you can't fake. You better show up, be real, and be a part of it because we will know if you're faking it. We will figure that out. And that is the commitment that great brands have made. And it's hard and it takes a long time and it's every day. And so anyway, that's that's why like a lot of this job, frankly, is exciting to me is I live and breathe this category, this brand in my normal life. It's not really nine to five to me. A lot of what I do isn't really work. It's kind of fun. I enjoy it. So I think that's if everyone could be so fortunate, we'd all like to go to work on Monday. Yes. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, I know we've talked about your market. It's growing. Any next moves, next innovations you're working on that you're trying to expand your market even further? Or just execute what you got? Well, startups, you know, have to chew gum and walk most of the time, right? Like we can never stand still. And in fact, we can't just not stand still. We have to be doing multiple things. And some of which will fail. So this whole idea of like testing and learning or aim fire, aim fire is real. And that's what makes, you know, working at Challenger Brands exhausting is this is the fight we fight and we have to keep sprinting. And so the short answer is yes, of course. We, first of all, have to go deeper. We will continue to build a performance brand in sports nutrition, full stop. And a lot of our core products today will do that heavy lifting for us. We have a really nice set of SKUs across juices and concentrates that meet the everyday athlete where exactly where they need to be. And so my job is just to get the word out, drive trial, use our pit crew for education. And we put those sort of pillars in place. However, we know as a brand, we want to go wider. There are adjacencies to sports nutrition that touch other categories like health and wellness. That is a category that we aspire to belong in too. Now, there's a bunch of other category norms in, in health and wellness that actually aren't the same as sports nutrition. For example, our products have sugar in them. They are from tart cherries. Fruits have natural sugars. That's not a surprise. In health and wellness, there is a definitive war on sugar. They do not like high sugar or even sugar products. So our category sort of nomenclature claims, qualifications, constraints change. And that's something where innovation obviously then comes in. So we're thinking hard about that stuff. Because like I said, we, we take these cultural sort of cues and make products for them versus think about our capabilities and shove our products in them. And so we're building back from what we believe the health and wellness future will look like. So we will do both. But yes, that is where our expansion or part of our expansion will come from. Awesome. Well, one of the things we like to do on this show, we already know you like nice fitting clothes, <laughs> but we like to get to know people a little bit more behind the topics we cover. And, um, my favorite question to ask folks that come on is, has there been an experience of your past that defines or makes up who you are today? Yeah, I alluded to it in the past uh, in, 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 you know, a little bit earlier, which was the decision for me to move to New York. By the way, I moved to New York out of college, out of UNC. I'd never been there before, sight unseen. And I, I just felt there was this sort of, I don't know, calling for me. Yes, it helped that I had a number of friends from college that were already going there. So there was a comfort level that I wouldn't be alone. But I moved to New York City. I'd never been there before. And definitively, like, I felt like I fit. And that was a feeling that I had never had before, really. Like, yeah, I like, speaking of, you know, I like things about fashion. I like the idea of, like, how clothes fit. I also, you know, enjoyed creative communities, artists. I loved music. And no city embraced that and celebrated that more than New York. I also, you know, I'm not a morning person, FYI. Like, I hate the mornings. And New York, obviously, is more of a city at night. And so all of those things, that was a decision that I made that, without question, I think changed my trajectory professionally, personally. You know, my, it helped my own identity. And I, I think where, if it's where you work or where you live, or how you spend your free time, like all of those things are where people find passion. I definitely discovered mine in New York. And I have a relationship with that city that to this day still feels like I'm home. And I really feel like that was something that really changed my life. What advice would you give your younger self if you're starting all over again? Take risks. I worried, you know, I think what advice would you give your younger self? It's, it's, it's an easy question. It's a hard one, right? Because I have a lot of sympathy for younger people. Like, 
humanity as a people leader is something that I think has changed over time. And in particular, I was watching another TikTok. This one was by Simon Sinek. And he said, the number one thing people want in the workplace, he's like, it's not money. It's not promotions. He said, it's safety. And I was, I, that, and this is, you know, during COVID where the workplace has changed so much and relationships have been harder to build and right. Zoom is, and is not a great communication channel for a lot of reasons. And it's hard to build safety, trust through that. And so I think, but people are their best when they feel safe. And the reason is, is because I think they take risks. I think they're bold. And I think they speak their mind. And that is what I try so hard to get my people. This company is like, let's be honest. Let's be candid. There is something to be about feeling safe. You can have real conversations with one another that allow the company to have bigger, better, faster solutions, products, marketing. So that's the advice I would give my younger self is find a place that you can work and feel safe and then take risks. Yeah. Oh, that's great advice. Well, as a as a marketer, um, curious if you think there's a topic that either marketers need to be learning more about or that you're trying to learn more about yourself. On the day to day, aside from like engaging, you know, marketers in particular are often the voice of the consumer inside of an organization. And so they have to pay attention. Now, I hope that's not quote unquote learning. I hope that's just interesting. Like I'm a curious person. Like Yes, this is something that I enjoy in my personal life because I am this persona. But what I do think marketers need to learn more about is what the rest of the organization does. And that requires learning because I think in building connections around operations or with people in finance, you learn a lot about what drives your company, your brand, your products to be successful. And ultimately, you don't know it, but it also helps you be a better leader because you learn the fluency of the language and why they make decisions that create connections and relationships with other departments. And so that's where I feel like marketers oftentimes assume they know better. And I would say one topic they need to be better about, we as people, but particularly in marketing, is be curious about other groups in the company and see exactly what they're doing and what they're working on. And in doing so, you'll be a better marketer yourself. No, I think that's great advice as well. Well, two last questions for you. One, the first is, are there brands, companies, or causes that you're following or you think other people should take notice of? There's a lot, right? I mean, there's a lot. I mean, I I think the first place you could easily just go is go to my Instagram feed. What are the brands that I love and will stop scrolling for? That's the, the first thing that I always kind of like. That's the filter, the criteria that I use of like, is this interesting to me? I think the brands that I'm paying the most attention to, one of which, frankly, is I've started to really like look into the world post-COVID around exercise and activity, which brands are like back out in the world. And one brand that's super interesting to me, mostly because they've made this huge leap, is Hoka, H-O-K-A. Like that was a brand that was for like serious runners only. They made these big, they still do make these shoes with like huge soles, right? It's like you're running on like foam. And they honestly, in my opinion, they were really ugly. I wouldn't be caught dead in those things. And Cher Bundy, we ran the hood to coast a couple of weeks ago. It's the longest relay race in America. It's 200 miles. It's from Mount Hood in Oregon all the way to the coast, seaside in Oregon. And it took us 27 hours. It's a 200 mile 12 person relay team. We did it with 12 employees. It took us 27 hours. We averaged eight minutes a mile for 27 hours. Two vans. That's a long time to run. You don't sleep. By the way, it's like the most amazing. It's a wild ride. It's incredible. I would tell anyone to do it if they if they want to do it. But I was then reintroduced to Hoka. And I was like, oh shit, this company has gone from like kind of running nerdy to running cool kid. And I'm like, whoa. This brand grew up. You know, what's that movie where uh, she walks down the stairs and all of a sudden, like, she's ready for prom? You know what the movie I'm talking about? She's all that. Have you ever seen She's All That, Alan? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I have. I have. It's been a while. You know, Freddie Prince Jr. Yes. Freddie Prince yeah, Jr., like, yeah, yeah, yeah. he meets, you know, this nerdy girl. And then all of a sudden, she, like, for prom, she comes down the stairs and all of a sudden, she's, like, beautiful. That's what Hoka was. Like, I was like, oh, my God. I like those shoes. It's kind of a silly answer to your question, but the point is, is, like, I took notice of them 
they engaged in a community. They showed up as them best selves. Their products are amazing. Half our team was wearing them. And I was like, this is pretty legit. So that is, you know, it's a, it's a really nice proxy for Chair Bundy, frankly, is like, who do we aspire to be like? That's one of those companies that I'm like, hmm, I pay, I'm paying attention. And so uh, anyway, that's, that's one company I started to take notice of. No, I love it. I love it. And I do, I see them everywhere now. Like people just like casually walking down the street, not running. And to your point, like they're not the most attractive shoe and, and like what my normal standards would be. <laughs> but so many people are walking around in them. I don't run long distances, but I kind of want to try them out. Like something special going on here and I need to know what it is. <laughs> they're like now an it girl shoe. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I'm like, yeah. what? Since, like, <laughs> Since yeah, because I agree. Like, they're huge. They look massive. On, they seem like I have never even tried to pair on, but they would look massive on my feet. The only up benefit for me is they might give me two more inches in height, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are like a platform for yeah, you, right? Are, like, yeah, exactly. They're like a platform yeah. shoe. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, that is an advantage for those that are vertically challenged. But anyway, that's one brand that I, I, like I said, I've taken notice of. And you're right. You can't seemingly throw a rock around here, especially because I spend half my time in Portland, Oregon. And or Portland, Oregon is like a major outdoors running community. Like they call it track town. So they're everywhere here. Well, last question for you. What do you feel like is the largest opportunity or threat facing marketers today? Well, the funny thing is that I think... The largest opportunity is that cultures become such a conversation. Like it's undeniable. And I, I, you know, one of the better or worse things about social media is that it's brought a lot of culture things first. That's a tremendous opportunity because it lives in your phone. You now don't have to be going to concerts. You now don't have to live in New York City. You now don't have to be able to afford it. You don't have to be a cool kid. It's just one scroll away. And for those that are curious, that is a major opportunity for brands to figure out how to belong, how to listen and be interesting. And so I think it's a, it's a massive opportunities for marketers because you still have to be curious. You still have to be proactive. You still have to have good intuition, but it's there. It's there easier and faster and better than it's ever been before. Now, I think the, on the opposite side of it, it's the same kind of point I made earlier, which is what is the threat? The threat is to try to be famous in a way that isn't who you are is to like chase that money. And that to me is shallow and desperate. And I think a lot of the bigger brands, because of the budget they have, find that to be the most convenient way to do it. And I've never found anything worth doing that is convenient. And so I think that is the biggest threat. And those are choices that people in marketing have to make and decisions that you know, sit in front of me every day, which is like, is this who we are? Is this good enough? Is this really interesting? Do I want to watch this? And oftentimes you can see lazy marketing from a mile away. And I think that's the biggest threat. Well, Rob, this has been a really fun conversation. I don't think I've talked about my height any more than I have in this conversation. <laughs> and we talked about CrossFit and all of these nice learnings and takeaways uh, on how to be a relevant brand in today's world. Thank you for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Yeah, Alan, thanks for having me. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with support from my team and podcast editors, sound engineers, and writers at Share Your Genius. Find them at shareyourgenius.com. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners. You can contact me on marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you will also find complete show notes, links to what was discussed in the episode today, and you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.